Okay guys, so as you are aware, we are talking about statistics today, and there's a lot of different mathematical formulas that we're gonna be using in this class in order to get some good statistical data. So first of all, what is statistics? We have a generalized definition here, a branch of math that provides techniques to analyze whether or not your data is significant or meaningful. Now, statistical applications are based on probability statements. We don't prove anything with statistics, um, but statistics report the probability that similar results would occur if we repeated the experiment again, which is really key in science. So keep that in mind as our definition as we move forward. Now we're going to look at a few different formulas and techniques we can use uh, or we'll be using commonly in our AP Biology class. Um, so feel free to pause at any time to take notes. So, Really quickly, I want to talk about populations versus samples. Now, populations include all members of a group. For example, um, all insects in North America. Um, now, obviously, we couldn't study all of that, so we're going to take a sampling of those insects. Um, and a sample is used to make inferences about the larger population. So samples are a selection of that population. Um, and we need statistics to describe how this sample population is an estimation of what's going to correspond in the larger population. Um, and so a lot of times this, if we were to survey the entire population, that would be costly and time consuming. So a sample is much, much better, especially for scientists who have a lot to do. Now when we're using samples, we wanna make sure we pay attention that it's a fair representation of the entire population. Um, and so we should always try to select randomly sampled members of the original population in order to avoid bias. Um, but there's gonna be a bias in a lot of ways we choose our sample members of a population. We'll talk about those later on when we talk about good experimental Design. All right, so first off, some techniques you've probably already used in many classes before are mean, median, and mode. Now our mean is just an average of our data set. So we take all the values in the data set, we add them up, and then we divide it by the number of values there. Our medium is our middle value in the, in the set, and it's not sensitive to outlying data, so that's why it's useful. Sometimes we have outliers that can really screw up our mean, and so we want to look at the median. And finally, the mode is the most common value of our data set. So for example, here in this really simple data set, um, we would first define the mean, we would add all these numbers together, and then divide by how many numbers we added. So we would add all these together, divide by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and I believe we get about 6.44 when we do that. So 6.44 would be our mean in this case. Our median, we would just look at the middle value, which in this case, we count up our numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We have an odd set, so we actually do have a middle number. So 7 is our median. Now if this were an even set of numbers, all we do is we would take the average of the two middle numbers put together. In this case, probably wouldn't be a problem because the sevens are common in the middle here. But say we had a seven and an eight in the middle, we would average these two together and we would get 7.5 as the median there. But that's only when you have an even number of uh, numbers in your data set. And finally, our mode, we just take the most common number, which again we see is seven. So seven is our mode in this data set as well. All right, so now let's talk about standard deviation. So a standard deviation is another way to talk about how much variation there is from the average, from the mean. So if all of our data points are really close together, our standard deviation is going to be small. If all of our data points are spread out, our standard deviation is going to be large. And this is our general equation for standard deviation. Here it is again in my ugly handwriting. So S is our symbol for standard deviation. And let's talk about how, would we, how we would work through um, this equation. All right. So we have our data set, and what we're going to first do is our first step is to find the mean. So we do what we did earlier. We find the mean. And then we're going to uh, determine the deviation of the mean for each value. Um, so this will, this will take us a while because we have to add up um, the deviation from the mean from every value in the data set. So for example, if our data set was something like 1, 4, 7, 8, 10, we would find the mean of this value set. And then we would take the deviation from the mean for each of these values. So then, then we would add all of these up, and that's what this symbol stands for, is the sum of those values. Then we have to calculate what's called the degrees of freedom. So we take the number of 
uh, values in our data set. So in this case, one, two, three, four, five. We would take five and subtract one. And that's how we get our degrees of freedom in a data set. So n minus one is technically degrees of freedom. And so we would take the sum of all the deviation from the mean divided by our degrees of freedom. Um, and then we put it all together to calculate our s, our standard deviation. So I know that was fast, and we'll do a lot of practice in class um, for it as well. I just want to let you guys know what that equation will look like. Okay, next up, we're going to see the standard error of the mean. So this is going to account for both sample size and variability. So it's used to represent un uncertainty and an estimate of a mean. Um, so as the smaller SEM gets, our standard error of the mean, the likelihood that the sample mean is an accurate representation. Um, and again, the larger it is, the more likely we have some discrepancies. All right, so, oops, get that page out of the way. Um, if we're using standard error mean, again, this is our equation for that, we just get the standard deviation, and then we divide it by our um, number of our values, square, uh, square root of the number of our values. Um, so for example, if say we just had a standard deviation of eight, and our values, we had 10 values in that data set, um, then we would take 8 and we would divide it by uh, square root of 10, which would give us about 2.5 if we round it a little bit. So our standard error of mean in this case would be about plus or minus uh, 2.5 from the mean. Oops, I'm right off, off paper. Okay, <laughs> very commonly what we'll see when we're using standard error of mean is our error bar bars on our graphs. Um, so we would mark one standard error above and below the sample mean, um, like we did in class already. So um, more than likely, if we don't have these error bars that overlap, that means our um, data set are statistically significant or have statistically significant differences in our groups. All right, finally, for the most fun, we'll come to our chi-square test. So sometimes we'll use what's called a null hypothesis, and that's just to see if the difference in our two sample or different sample populations is it due to chance or real statistical uh, difference. So the null hypothesis is going to assume that there's no difference or no change or no effect of the experimental treatment. Um, so we'll use our chi-square test, and chi is just our Greek letter that looks like this. Um, to evaluate the differences between our uh, expected high, uh, hypothesized or hypothetical data um, and our actual experimental data. So we'll use this in things like genetics, we'll use it in like our expected distribution of organisms. Uh, most commonly in this class we'll probably use it um, after we predict the, the outcomes of a certain genetic cross and then we'll use the chi-square to see how different our predicted outcomes were from the actual experimental outcomes of a real cross. All right, so this equation looks like this. It's not as scary as it looks. Um, what we have here is our chi-square. Um, again, we're going to take a sum. O is stand for observed. E stands for expected. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take our observed individuals, like say we're doing uh, genetics, we would take our observed individuals within a given phenotype, we would subtract the expected individuals within a given, within a given phenotype, um, square that together, divide it again by the expected, um, and then we're summing this up in summation, so we would add together a term for each condition. So to interpret a chi-square, we're going to get some random value. We don't really know what it means. We need to get our degrees of freedom once again. So again, that's the number of values in our that we're looking at, minus 1. And then we're going to use a chi-square chart, which I'll show you guys in class later on. Um, generally, if we have our in our column, our value falls into the column a 0 0.05, meaning there's a 95% chance that any difference between what we expect and what we observed is within accepted random chance. Um, any value larger than this means that we are going to reject our null hypothesis and there is a difference between our observed and expected values. Phew. Statistics is a lot, but it's actually kind of fun, so we'll get a lot of practice in this in the next few days. Um, so if what I just said was gobbledygook, feel free to go back and watch again, but also do not despair. We will have plenty of time to practice this. All right, thanks guys.